peace and freedom and grace be with you. My name is John Clifton with the Libertarian Party of New York and welcome to another edition of Hard Fire. On this episode we have two distinguished uh, physicians to talk about issues relating to uh, government interference or intervention depending on your uh, taste in organ transactions and debates or discussion of universal health care and where that issue stands as of today. Uh, joining me for this uh, is Dr. Arnold Berlin, who's an internist in practicing in Brooklyn. He's uh, director of the medical group IPA and is a professor uh, at Wheel Medical College of Cornell University. Also joining us is Dr. Steve Finger, uh, MD, of course, um, er, ear, nose, throat, uh, doctor and a facial plastic surgeon uh, and who has a website drfinger.com. I'd like to start off by talking about the issue of organs which Dr. Finger is involved in. Um, good grief, your name is, is an <laughs> organ. Uh, I'd like to talk about what your, your concept of what should be involved in or if anything or, or anyone should be involved in a transaction involving the use of organs between um, them each other for, for medical or maybe even non-medical purposes. Um, let me just set this up by um, a, a language that my, the producer of the show uh, suggested to me. Uh, the question goes along the lines of, do you own your own body? Does the government own it? If you <coughs> do own your own body, do you have the right to uh, the organs contained therein? If you have a right to the organs contained therein, uh, do you have a right to sell it? Uh, no. Is It isn't ethical? Um, who says it isn't ethical? Who gets to decide that? Uh, George Bush, Ted Kennedy, Hillary Clinton, uh, whomever. Um, do I need permission from the government as to how I dispose of my organs? Um, well, the discussion begins right now. Um, Dr. Finger, what what is your view? Well, as a libertarian, of course, I believe that every individual has the right to his own body and everything contained within, which includes the organs. Um, I don't really see any, any ethical issue with an individual being able to sell his organ for whatever reason. Um, I think it's a, it's a major tragedy in this country that so many people are unable to get organs. We now have over 60,000 people waiting for kidney transplants. Every year, 6,000 people die waiting for kidney transplants. The average wait is three to five years, uh, and I wouldn't have any problem with any individual wishing to sell his uh, a kidney or a part of a liver which could be transplanted. Uh, we already accept the fact that people can pay for blood donations. Um, bone marrow could be, could be sold in the same way because the transplant science is at a point now where um, we, we can prevent rejection and give people a better life but the, the supply of organs is a limiting factor. So as a libertarian, I would, I would have no problem with anybody selling their organ, as long as it's voluntary and they understand all the risks involved. Right, Dr. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask Dr. Finger a question, because I don't completely agree with you, respectfully okay. so. Okay. Uh, for instance, if a patient has marginal lung function, mm -hmm. and this patient is person, is in dire straits and somebody puts an ad out, give you $18,000 for a lung. So this person says, okay, that sounds great. I can provide for my family. I'm gonna sell my lung. The problem is this person's lung capacity is so low that when he takes out that lung, he may be ventilator or respirator dependent. Then the state is responsible or someone's responsible for his medical care. So obviously there have to be some controls in place to prevent such a scenario from happening. Uh, well, I don't think that would ever be an issue. I don't think that any, any reputable physician would, um, would take the lung from a person who needed the lung to live. But uh, what you're in, in essence asking is does an individual have the right to commit suicide? Since the person with marginal lung capacity would be giving away his only means of life uh, and he would, he would be in essence committing suicide, and uh, while that's not a, it's not a happy outcome, but an individual who wishes to commit suicide, that's their right. But I think that will be a very insignificant part of the problem. I think most of what we're talking about is um, 
kidney transplants, bone marrow transplants, liver transplants from people who can give up those organs without any um, any dire consequences. And of course, some of these some of this can be done post mortem. We're talking now now all the all the kidneys except from relative to relative are donated after death. Um, they could be sold after death by the surviving families also. I think I'm more in command and control issues than you might be. Uh, if a patient doesn't have sufficient cognitive function to decide if they really are capable of donating a, a kidney and wants to do this, although it's not a rational decision, what controls are there to prevent that person from acting? Well, I, I, I think this is a marginal issue, but in, in the few instances where you're talking about would a mentally retarded person who is not capable of understanding the consequences of his act be allowed to, to undergo the act, I, I think that we could, we could agree on some formula by which we could decide that the person is capable of making a decision, and if he's not capable of making a decision, then that would be another issue. But I think the vast majority of patients who would be donating their organs would be competent people who knew the consequences, and it would be, it would be the obligation of the physician involved to be sure that he knew all the consequences just the way patients are made aware of all the consequences of surgery today. Is, is, is there a problem with selling organs on eBay? Do you foresee a problem with that? If I, I want don't. to sell my liver, I can put it up well, on eBay? Well, I would eBay. interject at this point that there, are, there may be problems that come up in all kinds of human transactions or interactions, um, but the question is, you know, uh, is the interjection of a government solution or a forced solution the way to solve the problem? That that obviously there are liability issues for say eBay, um, possible uh, for uh, allowing uh, that kind of transaction to happen on its website, and you could say it's in their best interest to set rules saying we're not going to allow this kind of transaction on our website just because they can because it's their own private space, and that would be the way to in least in that instance. Um, stop that kind of transaction. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily stop it on other sites that have other rules. But um, are, are you able to, to um, imagine or accept other solutions to the problem, say outside of, um, say, a government law or regulation forbidding you know, this or that kind of transaction? I don't think that uh, organ sales can be uh, commercialized. I don't think they should be permitted to be commercialized. So you, much much as adoptions aren't uh, commercialized, adoptions are done um, through agencies, and there's very rarely money transferred except to cover the cost of delivery. Well, because if you can sell organs, you can mm -hmm. sell babies. What, what is the issue involved in, in selling organs? Why should not why should they not be allowed to be sold? If this is a voluntary transaction between the seller and the buyer, what's why is this the business of government to intercede? As long as everybody is informed, why, why do we have to have a law against it? Well, people were born with two kidneys. Um, it's true that you can live a lifetime with one kidney, but there's some inherent risk. And, and, and donating a kidney to someone else. Well, there's no question that there's a risk. And that's why the person making the donation would have to be aware of the risk. We wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be the kind of thing where you bend over in the street and somebody snatches your kidney up. Um, this would have to be informed consent. The person would have to know, the donor would have to know the consequences. But if he knows it and he's aware of it, and it's, it's his life and it's his kidney, uh, what would be the issue? I, I don't see why that would be a problem at I, all. I suppose it's an ethical issue of treating body parts the same as one treats uh, toothpicks, paper clips, and uh, car mufflers there's an inherent difference between those inanimate objects and life. Okay. Got life it. needs to be respected. These things can be commercialized. Life See, is sacred. That's very true, but just remember that every year 6,000 people waiting for kidney donations die. 6,000 patients waiting for kidney donations die because they cannot get a kidney donation. If they're able to get those kidney donations, then the, the sacredness of, this, of these 6,000 lives will be preserved. Um, I, I think like, that, okay. and if, especially if it's done in a voluntary manner, uh, what about those 6,000 that are dying every year? I would um, add that even though we, we let it run and, and go past this as an issue, the adoption issue, which is 
a different issue and beyond the scope of this discussion, is another area where libertarians would argue that it's not necessarily a, a situation that requires government intervention. If, if you can erect or maintain a private system that works out these rules about how to conduct private transactions to exchange um, or adopt children. Uh, another extension of the issue of organ donors uh, is the issue of, well, what if it's, you're not your own organ that, that uh, is being talked about being trans, uh, transferred to someone else? What if under cloning technology we're able to perfect the ability to clone human organs, uh, make a replica of your kidney, a third kidney, for example, or even at some point in the future, an entire person, um, what goes on in that situation? Do you, as the originator of the, uh, the original person who produced the cloned organ or the cloned person, have rights to clone, uh, I mean, excuse me, to send that clone organ to someone else? You mean if somebody voluntarily donates stem cells and the stem cells are cloned and, and an organ is produced from that? I, I think that you're talking really about an issue of contract, what the original arrangement was. If the, if the, if the person donating the stem cells uh, donated for that purpose, then well, why is that an issue? Uh, if it was used for some other purpose, then that's a contract violation. Um, I'm not sure that that's really a major issue. I don't understand uh, why it, that would it, be a problem. It was a theoretical uh, you have a... No, I think if someone uh, cloned a kidney and they had a contract with a science or laboratory company, mm -hmm. and the company paid the person for his cells, then the company owns the kidney and can do with it as they please. Mm -hmm. So where do you think government should definitely be involved uh, in, in, the, in the matter of, of clones uh, or organ um, donations, um, going back to the original issue of, of, of the person's original body part being um, transmitted to somebody else. Is there a circumstance where it absolutely is necessary for government intervention or regulation? Oh, I'm in favor of government regulation of these issues because I don't think that a laissez-faire system um, would have enough potential to control um, inappropriate actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a role for government in this other, mm -hmm. other than the typical libertarian um, uh, 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 view of government is that government should be involved in preventing force or fraud. As long as the individual donating the organ mm -hmm. is aware of the circumstances and there's nothing fraudulent and he's not being forced in any way, mm -hmm. then I don't think that government has a role here at all. I'm going to the, the role would be to prevent commercialization. Well, what's wrong with commercialization if it's done ethically, if it's mm -hmm. done without force, force or fraud? If somebody wants to purchase something, what's mm -hmm. the seller and the buyer are both agreed on, on this thing? What's, what is the issue involved? I mean, think of the thousands of people that would be benefiting mm -hmm. by, by making this available. I'm going to have to cut it there because I think the two dimensions of the issue has been expressed and I want to put in a plug for our party. So let me proceed with that by um, saying you are hearing ideas that you don't hear about many other places uh, or in the regular media. Uh, we try as libertarians to um, get our viewpoints known, especially on the internet uh, where we have tons of websites and, uh, and other uh, places to express ourselves. And I draw your attention particularly to our state website, um, ny.lp.org to uh, invite you to go to that site and explore the Libertarian Party of New York and the concepts and activities of the state party in trying to bring back freedom to New York, uh, whether it's in organ donations and, and, tra and transmissions and transactions or in ending smoking bans that uh, really have no, make no sense. Uh, in other words, trying to um, stop this pattern, uh, we see more and more regulations uh, to make freedom illegal in our, in our time and in our land. Uh, there are local organizations as well that like you to, to also explore the Manhattan Libertarian Party, ManhattanLP.org, uh, and also the Queens organization that meets monthly in Astoria, um, LPQC.org. These uh, local um, entities also involve 
and, and are involved in activities, act, activism, uh, conventions, and other uh, events that are helping to bring back liberty to New York and to uh, provide more choices and a more awareness of choices that should exist uh, in, in a land that has more voluntary um, transactions uh, as, as a rule instead of the exception. So I invite you to investigate the Libertarian Party, uh, both at the state level and, and our um, uh, borough-wide entities. The second issue tonight uh, has to do with the state of the issue of universal health care. It became a very big issue um, about 12 years ago when the Clinton administration attempted to um, nationalize 14 percent of the economy, according to uh, one um, uh, several estimates or the, the rhetoric of the time. Um, Dr. Berlin has his own ideas about how to institute um, a, a, a workable universal health care program, and I'd like you to give us an idea of how that would work. Well, I think Dr. Finger would agree uh, with this, uh, even though we may disagree on several other things, that the present health care system is ill. Uh, Hillary Clinton tried to fix the health care system as a neophyte, she really had no health care experience. She came in, learned the system, and created really a single-payer system uh, that was doomed to failure because uh, uh, monopolies have the potential to exert too much control. You see, I'm coming over to the Libertarian Party already. <laughs> yeah. We have room for you. <laughs> um, a single-payer system has the potential to control uh, salaries, the amount of care given, benefits, and who gets care. Those things really should not be allowed to be controlled by a single entity. Um, those things need to be determined by the doctor and the patient uh, with some overview and oversight by an entity such as a health care plan. Uh, the inefficiencies of the current health care plan include uh, multiple, multiple layers of duplication. Uh, I participate probably in a minimum of 20 different health care plans, which means that I filled out, completed 20 different applications to participate in these health care plans. Each of these 20 health care plans has their own set of rules and regulations dealing with issues of quality assurance, utilization mm -hmm. review. Uh, and monitoring and charges and cost and payment for health care. Uh, the duplication and multiplicity of this is ludicrous and more than inefficient. Uh, what I would propose is a three-payer system primarily to prevent a monopoly. With the three-payer system, you still have competition, but with the three-payer system, there still has to be some combined efforts, uh, applications to participate in the system should be one, because when you mail all the credentials, you shouldn't have to mail them to 20 different health care plans. Um, receiving monthly bulletins about the latest updates and uh, formularies, which are pharmacy benefits, the latest updates in disease management. What happens now is every time there's a, d a new disease management plan, such that a diabetic needs to be treated with this drug if he has this and such and such a condition. So I get directives from 10 different plans or 20 different plans. That's totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So that some of these issues need to overlap even on the three plans. All right. um, Dr. Finger, do you uh, think there is a, a need for uh, any version of universal health care? Uh, not if it's not if it's mandated. I don't think that we should have a universal health care system. I think first of all, the problem has been overstated. There are many people that use this, that uh, tell us we need a universal health system because there are 40 million people unemployed. Uh, 40 million people uninsured. uninsured. Excuse me. But what they leave out is that's that's only 14 percent of the population, which means that 86 percent of the population is insured, and of the people that are uninsured. Um, they're not going without care. They're just going without health insurance. So I'm not sure there's really a, such a dire need for universal health insurance. Um, and I, I agree with Dr. Berlin that, um, that a single-payer 
would be would would be uh, very deleterious to our system, and I, I think that would be the case, especially if it were the government. Mm -hmm. And the experience in other countries has has borne that out. And in Great Britain, where there's a single player system, where the government runs the whole system, people over 55 don't get dialysis. Mm. So they, you know, they, you're over 55, you need dialysis, it's goodbye, Charlie. And they're bringing back a private health care system in, in Great Britain. I think that's been the experience in many countries throughout the world. The, the way I heard a friend explain it, because she was an older woman, uh, they just, the soft way of doing it is they just don't tell patients over a certain age about all the options available. If, you know, they want to avoid talking to them about the more expensive options. And that way, in terms of um, uh, health care management, uh, the, the costs are kept down artificially because people don't understand um, all their the uh, possibilities. But I, I wanted you to clarify what, in a three-payer system, what are, who are the three payers that make up this system? Three separate private entities, but I also see some problem with allowing multiple plans and anybody opening up a health plan just to use a public utility system. Uh, we get our water from New York City water system. If, if 12 different players wanted to open up a, a water plant, water treatment and distribution facilities, there'd be a, a tremendous duplication of services and a huge capital cost involved in that because all of the water is coming to citizens of New York and you can't operate a utility in that fashion. Healthcare is somewhat of a utility. It's a right as much as water is a right. Well, I, I, this is just, I agree with your, your basic premise that the system is a very inefficient one, but I'm not sure I agree with all the rest of it. First of all, um, I'm not sure the water system is a good example because we now have a lot of electrical uh, uh, utilities competing to supply electricity. They, you can buy electricity from many different companies. But the they, grid all, is, they all work off the same lines, though. They, they share a grid, but they're separate companies and they're competing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that um, it's, always, it's always an argument in favor of government intervention that competition is expensive, it's duplicative, um, and it's wasteful. Uh, and experience, I think, has shown us that when government gets involved everything gets more expensive, it gets less efficient. And so the argument that we should have government come in because there are too much, there's too much competition, uh, I, I think that's a fallacious, um, fallacious belief. I think we'd be better off with the competition and let the market decide which companies survive than have the government come in and, and take over the whole shebang. It hasn't worked well in the past. Um, the concept here um, is that thinking that if, we, if we're understanding market and, and how it influences the healthcare system, just like with delivery of other services, uh, that both the original decision of uh, to provide the services and the original response of the market in terms of accepting that company um, solution, you know, to providing the services, determine whether the services get get delivered. You know, that, that even in the case of utilities, if you had comp more competition um, for even water. Uh, it would be up to the end. It should be up to the individual company to decide to get into the water business and take on all the problems, you know, in logistics of delivering water, and then the market, the consumers decide whether they there's room for three or four different or a dozen different providers. Um, same for healthcare. Um, and another question here is: um, Is there an opt out of any, you know, universal plan? If a plan is universal, how does a person opt out of it and not be part of it? I think a plan can be universal but not mandatory. You, maybe you have to opt in, not opt out. You can choose to participate in this program. You don't have to. Okay. It's an opt-in program. But if, it's not mandatory. But if one person is opting out and going a different route to get their services, then there's going to be a different system for that person. A private system. Yeah, and so there's, always, there's, there's going to be some duplication uh, under, even under the system yes. that you're outlining. It's not mandatory to participate in the plans of the three, um, the three plans that should be in existence. Mm -hmm. And um, what about the, the existing systems? Are they going to be merged, in like Medicare, Medicaid? Uh, are they are all the major um, healthcare providers? Are they going to be merged into one uh, entity, or are they just going to be all assumed under the three different? Uh, payer systems that your your system would set up. I, I would visualize three separate uh, 
payers under the Medicare system, which would mean that the 20 plans that I have to that I have presently uh, to participate with, seven of them would have to join, uh, seven more and seven more, so that there would be three total. So how would we decide who who gets to be those seven plans and which 17 get put out of business? Which how do how do you decide which of the three that are going to be mandated? And the others, which 17 get put out of business? Well, they would have to get together and write business plans with each other because it would be a directive that there are only going to be three plans. But they would just, they would just get together and decide that or, 17 or, of them are going to be they could, Or they could plan to, to not participate and try to make it as a private plan. So we're, we're, we're talking about managed competition in the industry and even cartelization under some circumstances when healthcare providers get together and decide who's going to be the winners, who are going to be the losers uh, in, in, in a consolidated system. Um, what, what would be the alternative um, in terms of a, a world without health care insurance at all? Well, you, in, I think that's a good question, and it's, it's helpful to put things into perspective and to realize that the current system that we have now where uh, office visits are paid, all medical expenses are paid, really actually began during World War II. During World War II, uh, wages were fixed, and the only way an employer could give an employee a raise would be in some roundabout way, and what they first started doing was giving them health insurance. And that's where this whole system began, and then it began to mushroom, and it got all out of, out of proportion. I can remember uh, a time when the, the health insurance was basically what we now call catastrophic health insurance, which means everybody purchases Everybody can purchase insurance for a catastrophe, but day-to-day -day insurance would be paid by the individual out of pocket. I'm, I'm afraid I'm sorry that you weren't able to respond, but we are just out of, out of time. I thank you both for tremendous contributions you made uh, in this half hour to this discussion, and I invite the audience to come back and listen to another episode uh, next week of Heart Fire. People were born with two kidneys. Um, it's true that you can live a lifetime with mm. one kidney, but there's some inherent risk and, and, and donating a kidney to someone else. Well, there's no question that there's a risk, and that's why the person making the donation would have to be aware of the risk. We wouldn't do it. It wouldn't be the kind of thing where you bend over in the street and somebody snatches your kidney. Up. Life is sacred. That's very true, but just remember that every year, 6,000 people waiting for kidney donations die. 6,000 patients waiting for kidney donations die because they cannot get a kidney donation. If they're able to get those kidney donations, then the, the sacredness of, this, of these 6,000 lives will be preserved.